and welcome to episode two of Corn Snake Corral. I'm Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Animal Sanctuary. This episode is airing on Thursday, September 1st, 2022. We're going to meet Roberta Lincoln. Not really meet Roberta Lincoln. You're going to get to see Roberta Lincoln, who's obviously one of our corn snakes. She needed a water change, and I'm going to go over a couple of different ways that you can manage water changes, and I'm going to show you how I decided to manage that tonight. And then I'm going to go over a couple of references that I recommend on corn snakes. Whether you're a new keeper or an experienced keeper, these are very handy references to have around. We're going to be working right now with a three-year-old female corn snake who is in this enclosure right here. She's an OKD corn snake and she was hatched on July 24th, 2019. She arrived here November 7th, 2019, and she needs a water cleaning. Now, typically I would just take the water out and clean it and put it back, but she's one of our snakes that actually hides under her water dish. She has a water dish that she's able to also use as a hide. So I'll show you what that looks like and I'll show you how I'm going to facilitate this water change and clean. And I may do it a different way if the circumstances were different, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So here's Roberta Lincoln looking at me from underneath her water dish. And I said that I might facilitate this water change in a different way if circumstances were different. She can eat tonight. So she last ate in the beginning of August, about three weeks ago. She hasn't been out and displaying signs of hunger, but she is tonight out. She definitely can eat since it's been about three weeks. And so the way I'm gonna change this water and do her enclosure cleaning tonight is I'm gonna ask her to shift out of her primary enclosure into a temporary holding bin so that she's not in the enclosure. I can clean it all out. She can eat while that's happening and then she can go on back in. Here I'm setting up a shift tub for her. This is just a plastic tub with a lid on it. I've got one perch in there, so there is something that the snakes can hold on to if they'd like. I'm setting that up ahead of time in front of the enclosure and I'm getting the enclosure doors ready to open so that when I'm ready to work with her, I don't have to fiddle with locks or security devices. I present the target to her. She's been target training the whole time that she's been with me, which has been two and a half years, almost three years. And so she absolutely knows what this means. And she comes out from underneath her water dish and she starts shifting into the shift. Now I borrowed this shift tub from Sundust, which is another corn snake we have. It may be the first and only time that I've had Roberta Lincoln shift into this particular tub, but she's shifted so many times into so many different areas that it's not a big deal for her. I know that she always constricts her prey and I use that to my advantage as I'm shifting her out. I don't need her whole body out because I know she's gonna constrict her prey and she sucks her whole body around that prey and into the tub and that is extremely convenient. So I figured out why it had been three weeks since she ate and why I hadn't seen her. Here's a shed in there and she must have left that just within the last few days. So I clean the shed out, I clean her water dish and her whole enclosure, and I wanted to show you the water dish to show you that it is a water dish that can literally double as a hide, although it's not meant for that. And there are no sharp edges on it, and there's plenty of space underneath for corn snakes. A lot of my carpet pythons really like this until they get too big for it. I got this at a local grocery store called King Supers out here in Colorado, and it's for dogs, but it works great for the corn snakes. Now, I wanted to go over if it's not an opportune time to clean the snake's normal water and you don't wanna be intrusive or cause them fear, anxiety, and distress, you can just take a cup of water, a coffee mug, a small bowl, and you can put it right inside the door so they have fresh drinking water until you have a more opportune time to clean their normal water. I didn't have to do that this time, so I just put that small dish in there to show you that that's an option. And then what I would do when the snake um, wasn't going to be stressed or there was just a better time is I clean the regular water. Now I'm gonna shift Roberta Lincoln back into her enclosure. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the shift tub up and then I'm gonna go and get my equipment before I take the lid off. And I'm going to hope that 
she's all up for a second prey item and that she shifts back into her enclosure, which she does. I don't always do this complete shifting behavior with Roberta Lincoln. I don't always ask her to shift all the way out and all the way in, although she has done this many, many times into different tubs, onto different stations and onto scales. Sometimes I feed her in the enclosure and when I do that, I still target train her. I just have her move some direction or move from one location to another within her enclosure. Sometimes I just have her shift out from under her water or I will target her just over the enclosure threshold but not have her come all the way out. So it's been a little bit since I've had her shift completely 100% out and then in, but she does just fine. And I'm sure that she was happy to have these two small mice after not eating for three weeks and going through the ecdesis process and leaving me that very nice whole shed. I try to make sure I put a lot of checks and balances in place, especially with record keeping. So each snake has a cage card with their name, species, hatch date, and the date they arrived. And I write down each meal and each time they shed, if I'm aware of it, on the cage card. And then I also keep a diary, which is mostly a food journal. I write down the date and the snake's name and what they ate, but I'll also add additional information in this diary if it's pertinent. Tonight, because she shifted 100% out and then back in, I just made a note of that so that I know that she did that shifting behavior on this day and during her meal. I have a third backup system. This is a chart that I have that I keep by the month. So I have one for each month and it's got all of our snakes listed on it in alphabetical order. And what I do with this is I just write down the date and then what they ate. And I do that, for example, this was the whole month of August. So I found Roberta Lincoln on the chart and she last ate on August 8th. So now I fill in August 31st and what she ate. And so I can just glance at it and see that during the month of August, she ate twice. And you can see that some of the snakes during the month of August ate more than twice. And some maybe only ate once. It depends on their species and their age and if they're going through ecdesis, et cetera. Welcome to my messy office that's right in the middle of one of the rooms that's got snakes in it, which is almost every room in our home. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about two of the reference works on corn snakes that I recommend. One is the Corn Snake Manual by Bill and Kathy Love, and it's put out by the Herpeticulture Library. And it's an older book. I think there's more than one version of it out there, but I do recommend it only because not only have they kept corn snakes for an extremely long time, but they've also produced corn snakes for a long time. So they have a lot of history with the species and they're very knowledgeable about the species. I'll also reference some interviews with Kathy Love that you could listen to if you'd like. But I wanted to read one part of this book in particular to you. Now this book is from 2000, so that's 22 years ago. And she has a section in this book that says stress and the unknown. And I'm just gonna read you directly from this book because I think it's extremely important. I was pleased to read it. And knowing that this passage is 22 years old makes me stop and wonder how we went from naturalistic keeping and trying to keep animals that we bring into captivity from the wild in naturalistic enclosures and trying to mimic their natural habitat to keeping them in drawers. It's just incomprehensible to me. It says stress is still the black hole of disorders, but it's starting to catch at least partial blame these days as the cause or at least precursor of a multitude of maladies. We all know that nervous snakes don't act normally or feed regularly. Why shouldn't other forms of stress affect different aspects of their behavior too, as it does in humans? The signs are usually less obvious than the straightforward refusal of food. So it's up to us as their caretakers to observe, access, and react to subtle indications of these problems and contribute new solutions. We certainly don't have all the answers yet. Remember, this is 22 years ago. I feel like she has a lot more answers than some people do now. But as concerned herpeticulturists, 
We are interested in advancing this area of study. A few examples may help illustrate some things we've noticed so far and emphasize the importance of speculating further on this oft neglected topic. Our favorite culprit is the syndrome of captivity that could be dubbed limited freedom of choice. It ends up working its way into a large percentage of the answers we give to people by phone and in print. Simply summed up, most captive situations, and we're including the bulging ranks of new people keeping corn snakes in our assessment of most, do not offer the voluntary range of daily environmental choices available in the wild. Thank you, Bill and Kathy Love. I preach that today and I stand by that today that we need to be offering our corn snakes and our other species of snakes and really any animal that we keep under captive management as naturalistic habitats as we possibly can as well as offering them novelty because yes, they are going to encounter many things under captive management that they would not encounter in the wild. But the bottom line is whether we're using naturalistic things like real rocks, real logs, real substrate, or whether we're using similar items that are manufactured like plastic logs, like PVC perching, like instead of rock hides, a plastic hide, we still need to make sure that we are offering our corn snakes and other snakes the opportunity to express species typical behaviors so that they are able to express innate behavioral urges that they have that they would be doing in the wild even though we are keeping them under captive management because what happens if they don't have the opportunity to express behaviors that they have these innate urges to do is we're going to start seeing issues under captive management mental and behavioral health issues, physical health issues, maladaptive behaviors, stereotypies, apathy, lethargy, and perhaps other things. So in addition to Bill and Kathy Love's book, which no pun intended, I absolutely love, especially because they have behavioral information in here. I also recommend this book, Corn Snakes in Captivity by Don Soderberg. And this is going to be a good reference if you just wanna make sure that your general basic care is appropriate. So temperatures, substrate, enclosures, etc. This is going to have basic information about how to keep your corn snake under proper environmental conditions. It's not really gonna have any information in here about corn snake behavior, but it's a good reference about feeding, sizes of prey to feed, what to do if the snake doesn't eat, what to do if the snake regurgitates, solid information about things like that. And so I also recommend this book. My version of it is from 2006. I'm not sure if there are other versions available, but again, these are the two number one books that I recommend to new corn snake keepers or even experienced keepers who would like a good shelf reference about corn snakes. The Corn Snake Manual by Bill and Kathy Love, any edition that you can find, and Corn Snakes in Captivity by Don Soderberg. In the description of the video, I'm going to link some interviews that I'm aware of with Kathy Love. I think I may have an interview of Don Soderberg saved or bookmarked somewhere that I will also include. And then I'm going to include the link to Reptifiles because that is the complete corn snake care guide that I recommend. Mariah Healy of Reptifiles does an amazing amount of research on all of the topics that she covers. She researches care and husbandry to do those care sheets the same way that I dive into behavior and training. I do deep dives into the scientific literature and all resources that I can find. And she does the same thing for care manuals. So I highly recommend that you go to Repti Files and check out their corn snake care manual. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me this week for episode two of Corn Snake Corral. Please let me know if there are specific topics that you would like me to cover as long as they are related to animal training and behavior because I don't want to stray outside of my lanes. I have a certain area of expertise and that's what I want to share with you. If you want information about corn snakes that I don't cover, please ask me and I'm sure that I have a very reputable reference for you. Please also remember that we are located at Spirit Keeper Animal Sanctuary. I live and work on an animal sanctuary. There are lots of different animal species here and sometimes you're gonna hear background noise and that is just the way it is. If you don't like the background noise of other animals, 
which are sometimes dogs, cats, horses, and the miscellaneous other species that comes through here, you're welcome not to watch the videos. Until next time, everybody please remember to always be kind and love your animals.